Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, Tome 17 and the new lore it brings for Kazan Yamaoka, the Oni. After three tomes in a row of brand new original characters getting expanded stories, we finally have a tome starring older characters again. And Behaviour picked a really interesting pair of characters for this return to form. The new lore for Tome 17 features stories for Feng Min and the Oni, the two oldest original characters yet to receive stories in the tomes. And my expectations were high, and fortunately, exceeded. Feng Min and Oni have brought us some of the best tome stories we've had in a long time, with Feng Min especially being a standout who will get her own video in the near future, rest assured. But before we cover her, it's time to look at a character who I once dubbed the best written character in all of DVD history. Kazan Yamaoka, and see if his tome story lives up to his legendary base lore's quality. Normally when I do tome videos, I assume you as a viewer already know the fundamentals of the character, so I don't end up repeating myself unnecessarily, but Kazan's lore is old enough, and frankly my video on him is old enough too, that I feel like a refresher is in order to give us a benchmark for this tome to work off. If you don't need to know this, you can skip ahead using the chapter system. So, what's the story with the Oni? Kazan Yamaoka was born in Kagawa to a noble family towards the end of the Edo era of feudal Japan. With the rigid social structure that defined the Japanese era of isolation was starting to break down, and Western traders started to arrive at Japan's shores, with their navies in tow, in case the isolated shogunate wasn't interested in trading, and more direct diplomacy was required. As international trade poured into the country for the first time in centuries, and the commoner classes began to accumulate wealth and status, Kazan saw this shift in the social order as an insult to his family and their noble heritage, and decided to rectify this with a bloody campaign across Japan. Alleged samurai failing to keep order, commoners getting ideas above their station, and merchants who gave them shelter and supplies were all targets for Kazan's wrath, and his brutality and bloodthirst was such that he started to gain a reputation and a nickname that he grew to resent, Oni Yamaoka. This bloody crusade came to a head when Renjiro, Kazan's father, crossed his path to stop his son from causing any more damage, a fact which Kazan only realised once he'd crushed his father's skull with his cannibal. Despite being stricken with grief and rage at what he'd done, Kazan committed to his cause and dismembered samurai warriors and mocking lords alike, but when the peasantry revolted against him in great numbers, Kazan was overwhelmed. Shut up, will you? Left for dead on the floor of a stone mill, Kazan would have perished in ignominy if the entity hadn't scooped him up from the floor of that stone mill and twisted him into something far more useful to it. A mockery of his former self that truly gave meaning to the name Oni Yamaoka. Kazan's base law was absolutely fantastic. It painted a picture of a monstrous figure of violence and austere traditionalism whose pride and bloodlust stained the countryside of Japan red. And that figure was woven into a much bigger picture of the story's historical context, which I talked about in my old video and will be discussing more as we cover this tome. Similar to many of the recent entries like Singularity, Skull Merchant and the Lira siblings, this tome entry is not one continuous narrative, but a series of snapshots loosely strung together to illustrate the character over time and how he changes. There are three distinct sections to this story. Kazan's arrival at a village during his wandering through Japan, his activities at a port where trade was going on between Japanese and Western merchants, and for the first time ever, a showcase of the killer inside the fog itself, and the way he thinks and sees the world of the entity after his re-sculpting into its minion. Let's start with the first of the three story sections in this tome, Kazan's arrival at a humble farming village as he wanders the Japanese countryside. Right away we're given this image of idyllic feudal farmland, Hard-working farmers squaring away their crops at the crack of dawn, a peaceful and ordered place just like it had been for centuries of isolated peace. It'd almost be a stereotypical image, were it not for the function that starting the story with this image plays in building Kazan's character. To somebody as austere and traditionalist as Kazan, this is an idealised image of Japan, a symbol of the way things have been for centuries, and that symbol is one Kazan would fight and kill to preserve. This is why the slovenly samurai he encounters when he arrives at the village incense him so badly. Because their presence, not as noble aristocratic warriors, but as layabouts and drunkards, makes the samurai name and hierarchy that Kazan respects look like a joke. 
with one of them even wearing his Kusazari leg armour while he sleeps off his drunken stupor. To be clear, these aren't actual samurai, but peasants wearing armour scavenged from dead samurai, an act of savagery and subversion which Kazan treats with extreme prejudice. As Kazan brutalises these impostors in front of their village, we get to see an example of probably the biggest reason I think this tome is so good. Almost every event in this story can be seen and interpreted in two separate but interesting ways. Kazan's personal narrative, how the event in question and Kazan's reaction to it shapes his character, and a historical narrative, where you can treat the events you're reading as a historical allegory that reflects the context of late Edo era Japan more broadly. It was this effortless fusion between solid character work and a deep understanding of the historical context that caused me to praise Kazan's base lore so highly, and the tome very much follows through on that, as you can see in this scene at the village. A traditional and tranquil Japanese farming village being ran by brigands and pretenders in stolen armour is a pretty powerful image when you look at the state of the withering shogunate government in the late Edo period. By the early 19th century, which is about the time of Kazan's crusade, the arrival of Western money and goods into the country allowed the merchant class, who were easily the lowest rung on the Japanese social hierarchy before, to accumulate power for themselves, because they could buy and sell goods to outsiders that the shogunate could not easily control. The poor got richer. Those without status suddenly had the means to buy that status, and that's what these imposter samurai and their scavenged armour represent. They were a symbol of nobility and prestige not because they earned the honour or were born into the right family to inherit it, but because they were able to pay for it. Kazan's fury at the impostors wearing armour that by the law of the land they should not have, that they do not have the right to wear, comes from this place of social progress and Kazan's absolute loathing of the changing world. He sees himself as putting his hand on the tiller to correct a horrifying course that he believes Japan is set on, a course that will result in the devaluing and ultimate destruction of the noble samurai tradition that he was brought up in. Without his intervention, the world he was promised to inherit will never come to pass. Of course this isn't the only way to analyse this scene, because viewed from the perspective of Kazan as a person, we get to see how Kazan reacts to something not fitting in his established view of the world. He doesn't offer these men a chance to explain themselves, instead treating them with excessive force to remove the stain on this idyllic picture he holds so dear. The fact that he catches himself screaming as he kills them betrays the truth of his bloodlust. Despite the layabout impostors being far from aloof picture as a noble swordsman, his hollering barbarism really isn't better. And as the residents of the village come out to watch the display of violence, he realises this for a second, scooping up the broken armour and departing without a word. This image is darkly comical in a way. The idea that he's shown his true self to be such a deranged lunatic that he's almost embarrassed by himself. Leaving before he has to think about it too much like he's just knocked some priceless vase off somebody's shelf and is pretending it was just like that when he found it. When the village comes out to watch, he doesn't say anything. No threats, no bargaining, no moralising. Because his screaming rampage has pretty much robbed him of all legitimate authority. And as we'll see towards the end of the story, he very much understands this. It isn't until the next section that Kazan's attempts to assert his authority gain some air of legitimacy, as a motley resistance put up against him allows him to effortlessly show his superiority in combat and even a smidge of honour. As Kazan beats 11 men into bloody pulps, we get to see where all that samurai training has taken him, and as you read, it's clear that Kazan takes some pride in dispatching these men with such ease. He fends them off so well that not even a single blow manages to hit home. Although it is telling that he doesn't use his father's sword, which is a symbol of samurai nobility and heritage, but instead the kanabo, a symbol of Kazan's demonic savagery and brutal strength. Perhaps it's no wonder then, when a young man who sets upon him with a rake spits the insult of Oni Yamaoka at Kazan, who for his part reacts in much the same way you'd react if a mosquito bit you on the arm and then called you a dickhead when he swatted it off. But Kazan ultimately lets the young man off with a warning. Which would seem out of character for a bloodthirsty and easily insulted mass murderer, but if you ask me, this is an extremely rare moment of Kazan holding himself to his own high standards of nobility, as he recognises that while the boy insulted him, he's not pretending to be something that he's not. He's not an imposter samurai, he's a farmhand trying to defend his countrymen, and on some level Kazan respects that. Killing someone in that way would be beneath him, which is pretty forgiving even by samurai standards. Since while they couldn't kill commoners whenever they liked, they did have the right to kill anyone from the lower orders who insulted them. By the law of the land, Kazan would have been completely within his rights to kill him, 
but he chose to let him go, and in part, I think, because Kazan respects him, and in part to preserve the idea Kazan has in his head that what he's doing is ultimately noble. But it doesn't matter. He let one of them go, but that's nothing new. Every now and then, the little victim's spared because she smiled, because he's got freckles, because they begged. And that's how you live with yourself. That's how you slaughter millions. Because once in a while, on a whim, if the wind's in the right direction, you happen to be kind. There's a lot of killing in Kazan's story, but letting that boy go might be the most harrowing thing in this whole tome. Because letting him live as this tiny, meaningless little mercy is how a man like Kazan is able to live with himself. How he's able to write off the worst excesses of brutality and violence as merely the consequences of doing the right thing. Doing what must be done to set things the way they should be. It's how a man who's committed himself to a very, very dark path can tell himself the barefaced and blatant lie that he's doing the right thing. So he can keep hurting and hurting without a flicker of doubt in his mind. It's the logic of a monster. And the tale of Kazan's monstrosity has only just begun. But before we continue this story of a very large man causing property and bodily damage to a bunch of people who may or may not deserve it, I'd like to talk to you about today's sponsor, who is sponsoring videos on this channel for the past year now and who I'm always happy to have as recurring friends of the channel. Many of us someday will find ourselves in need of legal assistance in the event of an accident at work. But today's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan, can be right there to make sure you don't have to face it alone. If you're injured at work and don't know where to start, Morgan & Morgan ensure it's easier than ever to make those first steps to getting the compensation you're owed. Hiring a lawyer can be a daunting process, but with Morgan & Morgan you can submit a claim without ever having to leave the couch. In 8 clicks or less, you can submit your claim to Morgan & Morgan and trust that your legal troubles and capable hands so you can focus on your recovery and your well-being, on getting your life back together. For more information, you can check out ForThePeople.com or dial pound key law in your phone. Without further ado, let's get back to talking about the Oni's Tome. The second part of Kazan's Tome takes us to the coastline of Nagasaki, where Kazan's sights are set upon a harboured ship where Western traders do business with Japanese smugglers and merchants. After conferring with Shuzo, a fellow nobleman and the closest thing Kazan can really have to a friend, he decides to board one of these foreign ships himself, and the results are, well, I'll let you see for yourself. Like the altercation in the village, Kazan's brutal actions on board the ship can be seen in two different ways. A social and historical reading, and a personal reading that says something about Kazan himself. The historical reading is pretty blunt. A nationalist samurai boarding a western trading ship and brutally killing everybody on board, Japanese dockhand and western merchant alike, before burning the ship to the ground is about as subtle as a brass band and a public library. When Westerners started knocking on Japan's door with a bag of tradable goods in one hand and a loaded gun in the other, the shogunate's policy of isolation started to look like a complete joke. They couldn't really say no to these Western traders because starting an economic war with the West would be to also start a literal one. A war after centuries of enforced peace, it was far from likely that they'd win. A lot of nobles, especially in Japan's southern domains, were not happy about this. And the Sunojubi political movement was formed in response a push to overthrow the toothless Tokugawa shogunate and restore the emperor, who had been a symbolic political figurehead for centuries while the shogunate held the real power. The Sunojui movement, which translates to revere the emperor, repel the barbarians, sought assassinations and attacks on western officials in the country, 
and while Western military intervention saw the movement eventually put down, it did sow the seeds for the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate and the Meiji Restoration that saw the Emperor return to power in 1868. In this context, Kazan's torturing of the Western trading ship in the Dejima Bay could be considered an act of political vandalism. Even though the term Shono Joui is never used in the story, militant action against the Western interference was common among the group and it was something you could pick up on in the subtext of the base law. I'm really glad to see that this element was doubled down on in the tome, especially with the character of Shuzo reminding us that as much as Kazan fights alone, he really wasn't alone, in his resentment and fear of a rapidly changing social landscape. Shuzo feared for the well-being of his son, and with the foreigners' demonstrated ability and willingness to hurt anybody who got in their way, he may well have been right to. But looking at this story and cinematic as part of Kazan's character shows us that even if he is doing the right thing and torturing the ship, and that's a very big if, he definitely isn't doing it for the right reasons. At the end of this second section, Kazan has found the ship that he believes is responsible for the illicit trade, and asserts that if they are criminals, they'll be brought to justice. But the people on that ship aren't exactly given a fair shout to defend themselves, to prove their case to him. He gets on board that ship and immediately starts chopping away. It's not exactly a bipartisan parliamentary inquiry, is it? And it's clear from the way that Kazan voices his concerns that he's not torturing the ship out of some protestation against imperialism, he clearly doesn't have an issue with Japan citizens being made into subjects, he just has a problem with Japan citizens being made other people's subjects. He's not a liberator fighting back against oppression, he's got far more in common with a slave owner. Fighting for his property back and combined with his brutality, this robs Kazan of any legitimacy that he could have had. There's something to be said about the fact that Kazan in the cinematic is quite young and clean shaven, far from the old man yells at Cloud, that the fandom typically portrays him as. Even Hooked on You did this. And I think that this youth was a very intentional choice because it shows something important about Kazan. He's not some old patrician, sad to see his children's legacy fall to ruin. But he's a young man whose father has told him to cool the fuck down, but he's too busy tied up in his own rage and entitlement to get the perspective he needs. Kazan's conservative, but he's not old. His bitterness comes from being a young man who's been denied the respect and status that he believed he was going to inherit. And what we're seeing here isn't a desire for a return to justice, but simply a temper tantrum. And nowhere is this clearer than in the third section, where we follow Kazan into the realm of the Entity itself. It's been implied in several killer stories before that the Entity induces hallucinations in some of the more uncooperative killers to show the survivors to them as people they'd have a good reason to want to kill, to give them a reason to do it. Dessinger, for example, has shown images of the rich tycoons and prison guards he hated throughout his life, and the twins are shown hooded Black Veil cultists to force Charlotte to fight to defend herself. The white eye theory is a pretty common one here among fans, a theory that if a killer has plain white eyes, and the entity is clouding their vision with these hallucinations. And this new story segment about Kazan, who also has milky white eyes, seems to validate that theory somewhat. While hunting in the fog, Kazan finds the body of a samurai wearing broken armour, the soul and plate of an imposter. But as Kazan approaches him, he sees a mask of his father staring back at him. The figure peels it off, screaming as if he was removing his own face, before collapsing into a shapeless, foggy mass, and Kazan finds himself drowning in his own self-doubt. In this section, everything I was saying about Kazan's own inconsistencies and wavering authority is writ large. He tries to reconcile his commitment to restoring his family's honour and status with what he did to his father, and he just can't make the logic work. He can't make it make sense, and his response to this shows the kind of man Kazan truly is. Rather than accepting that he made a mistake, reflecting on his actions and stepping away from it as a better and wiser man, Kazan regresses into a screaming man-child, swinging his kanabo around as if having a tantrum is going to make anything better. As his father's image dissipates, leaving Kazan on his own, the truth about who he is becomes impossible to ignore. He's never been the nobleman that he aspired towards, just an angry, entitled man who goes on violent temper tantrums when social change keeps him from what he perceives as his birthright. There's no honour to his actions, no consistent reason, no accountability to the hierarchy he reveres so highly, just a rage that can only be quenched in blood. He's a bully, lashing out thoughtlessly, because actually thinking about what he's doing might suggest that he's doing something wrong, and that would be unthinkable, wouldn't it? The noble Kazan Yamaoka being wrong, that's something that he could never have imagined. 
He's not just angry and entitled, his childlike tantrums are pathetic. And if this is truly the champion of samurai families, a symbol of resistance against change and a return to traditional social values, if he really is the best they can do, maybe they should have gone extinct. Maybe the world would be better off without men like Kazan Yamaoka. Kazan's tome is a fantastic piece of writing that builds effectively on the character shown in the base lore, and while it doesn't really show us anything terribly new, it does give him a bit more depth and pushes the, what we could simply infer from the base lore into far greater focus. And just like the base lore, it's interwoven beautifully into real life history. Which leads me to a big question. Way back in the day, I said that Kazan's lore was the best in DVD history. So now that he's gotten this fantastic tome, do I think he deserves that title again? Honestly, maybe, but I don't know. It's a testament to how much better DVD's story has broadly gotten over the years that Kazan actually has competition at the top now, and trying to rank him alongside characters like Twins and Plague honestly feels more semantic than anything. At this point, it doesn't even really matter whose is the best, because the main thing that we've got here is another wonderful story on our hands, and best or not, that's all any of us could have asked for. Those of us who've been waiting for years for Oni's law can rest easy now. It's here, because the big demon daddy was finally done justice. And it gives me hope that Behaviour can keep up this trend of high quality original storytelling. More than anything else though, Tome 17 proves something I've been saying since the Forge and Fog mid-chapter. If the goal of the tome is to deliver high quality new storytelling, the old system where older characters were prioritised for new tome stories ahead of newer releases was way better at delivering that than the new system, where original characters get tomes immediately after their release. Out of the six character stories that we've had under the new system, maybe one to three have actually been good, whereas basically every tome story under the old system since Tome 10 has been a great read. Jonah's tome was the only exception here. Let's be honest, it's Jonah, that was really just polishing a turd. Since the next killer is also licensed, we've got one more tome where we'll stick to the old system before going back to the new one. But I seriously hope the positive reception to Tome 17 makes Behaviour genuinely reconsider the relevance of the old system because it truly gave us the best stories we've ever had. And if Kazan's new lore isn't proof of that, then stick around for a few weeks and see. Because I'll be covering Feng Men's new lore shortly, and if that won't convince you, nothing will. But don't you worry, I've got plenty to cover before then. Next time we'll be doing another video in the Potential and Problems series, covering a franchise that was in Behaviour's community survey, but I guarantee you won't have people talking about before. And if the event tome has interesting lore in it, I might do a video covering The Void before October is out. When October's over, oh boy I've got some plans. If you want to make sure you don't miss out then do subscribe and ring that little notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on the next upload. And once again thank you from Morgan & Morgan for being just consistently excellent sponsors to work with, and also to my wonderful patrons who help keep the channel running. They got to see this video a day early, so if you were interested in doing that and getting a bunch of other sweet perks, hop on the Patreon and chuck a few quid my way, it would be much appreciated. On that note, I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.